Absolute Emperor. Napoleonic War Game Battles. We're gonna play a large battle. We're talking 40,000 men on either side. We're gonna play it in the next video. I think this introduction, setting the scene, talking about the scenario design, makes for a really good video on its own. Because even if you don't want to watch me play a solo game of Absolute Emperor, it may be worthwhile to see how I've set up this battle, the Battle of the Mincio River. See the blue yarn down there? That is the Mincio River. That is the setting for a battle from 1814 that is going to pit an Austrian army led by the experienced Field Marshal Bellegarde against a French army led by Napoleon's adopted stepson, Eugène de Beauharnais. Kind of a fun little battle here. Now, as you know, those of you that have been around for a little while, we have played through not just one Battle of Bumville, not just two Battles of Bumville, but a whopping three Battles of Bumville. Unfortunately, I don't have enough figures. I, don't know, I might be able to do Alao. But this is a rather big table. For the record, my table is 30 inches across and about 32 inches deep. If we scale that up to, to 28 millimeter, this allows me to play on the equivalent of a 5x5 five five table, 60 inches by 60 inches. I'm using 2 millimeter figures. The terrain that you see here, all of these lovely little villages are, are they all? I think they're all figures from irregular miniatures except this bridge, which is from Pico Armor. And then this, these hills over here are also from irregular miniatures. We'll go over the terrain first real quick, and then we'll go over the uh, victory conditions and whatnot. This is uh, Viejo up here on the hill, and then we've got three crossings. We've got Monzambano. We've got a, you know, this bridge. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to swap this out. There is no built-up area here. This is a bridge, and this is a built-up area over here. And so that's a rather large town of Goito, and then up there is Rover Bella, and down here on the hill is Volta. This battle is a little bit different because instead of having two forces lined up, historically what happened is both of the armies kind of blundered into each other in the early foggy morning and were unable to kind of consolidate all other forces on one side or the other of the river. That's going to be a bit of a challenge for this rule set, which is fine because this is how so many battles operate, right? Gettysburg is the famous example of just kind of shoving stuff at the enemy, get it in there as fast as you can. And it's also an example of how the, the area outside the battlefield, that kind of strategic situation, the, the surrounding countryside, affects what goes on at the table. You don't always have the luxury of lining up and then coming at each other. Sometimes your, your guys are coming in from these roads and it gets a little bit awkward and a little bit complicated. We like complicated. So I'm going to set up the armies and I'm going to show you where the people are coming from and how they're coming on. Because we do have some reinforcements that are going to be coming on, not at the start of the fight. We're going to talk about how this unusual setup is going to be influenced by the rules of the game, particularly the command and control structures. Now we've got some troops on the board and as you can see, generally speaking, the Austrians are up here. The French are over here, and then I also have some French reinforcements coming over here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the rule-specific parts of this scenario. Hey, Bridge, don't topple over just yet. Got to wait for them sappers to arrive. We're going to talk about how I developed this scenario, and the short answer is I didn't. I went to a website called napoleonicscenarios.weebly.org, I think it is. I'll put a link in the description. And they have like 23, 20 plus scenarios perfect for Napoleonics. They've done all the research. They've put together orders of battle. The problem is they put their orders of battle together for games that most people play. I want to say it's for something like Blucher, Grand Armé, you know, something big and important like that. We're doing this fun, silly little Boyd Bruce game called Absolute Emperor, and, I, and I'm being a, a, just a tiny bit facetious. This is a great game, and it's really going to help us understand how Napoleonic battles were fought but some of the conventions in this game don't parallel the conventions that you see in games like Grand Armée. So if you take an order of battle for that game, you got to kind of 
shove an absolute emperor amount of gallons, it will, no, it's the other way around. You're going to shove Grand Armée gallons into an absolute emperor-sized bucket. So, for example, the French have, I think their actual order of battle was something like 12 divisions, well, of infantry. And I'm looking at two, four, five, six, seven all together. So what I did is I kind of combined divisions. Where things really break down is the command and control. In Absolute Emperor, I'm going to use this Red General. Here, let me pull all three of these up. And I can introduce you to our leaders for the French. This is going to be Napoleon's stepson, Eugene. And then we have Grenier and... Um, and uh, who I, I don't even remember his name. This other unnamed general. Basically, what I've done is I've promoted a division commander to a corps commander. The overall fight in a normal battle would be between two corps, but I've divvied it up based on kind of points and historical arrivals so that what we have for the French are two individual corps. As you can see, this one has two line infantry and a cannon. And over here, the main body of troops has three-line infantry, and I'll show you the difference because the two in front, the bases look like this. Again, irregular miniatures. You can see that uh, nice, is that a tricolor they're flying? Over here, you've got nice, even, nice rows. This is our seasoned troops. These are our conscripts. So they've got, everybody is seasoned except for we've got a conscript over here. I've tried to keep the ratios about the same. So where they've got this many troops. This might represent a total of 12 divisions. The numbers were relatively equal on that day, so I gave them equal numbers, but the French, because it's 1814, they have, uh, their troop quality had begun to suffer at that point. They have a couple of, whoops, I got one of these bases wrong. This is a conscript base. Let me pull out, and hey, this might be interesting for some of you guys. This is how I store my units. I went down to the craft store, and these boxes are designed for four by six photographs, but they work perfect. You can score store 24 bases. These are one-inch bases. And then I just cut a piece of foam, and it holds them down in place. And when I'm ready to rock and roll, I can just pop it open like that. But I'm looking for, where's, and then I color coded them, so my blue, here we go. So my blue boys, my French are in the blue uniforms, they're in the blue box. And then they all fit together in a little handy dandy carrying case like this. So I can carry all five armies. I've got, as you can see, I've got Austrians in yellow and white, and the French in blue, but Eugene has got the red uniforms because we're using a British figure to distinguish him, the overall commander, from the two core commanders. In Absolute Emperor, these guys have to stay within nine inches of him. All of their troops have to stay within four inches of the core commanders. Technically, I know he's a core commander, but for the sake of the game and for the sake of having an interesting battle with interesting tactical decisions, we've broken it up into two cores. Let's talk about the Austrians now and where they come on. Oh, by the way, these reinforcements over here for the French, these are attached to Eugene. They have come to the battlefield a little bit late. As you might guess, they are going to start the battle, they're likely to start the battle out of command. So their first orders, regardless of what their commander's orders are going to be, their first orders are going to be, get to within four inches of your boy. Only if they blunder into the enemy or are intercepted will they engage in anything else. Now, they will engage, but any opportunity they have to get back into command, they're going to take that. Likewise, for the Austrian reinforcements, the French have conscripts and... Uh, they're, oh, I'm sorry, this, they're coming on on turn six. Conscripts and one division of seasoned infantry. Up here, the Austrians have a division of seasoned infantry and a piece of artillery that are going to come in on this hill. Up there, we've got two units of seasoned infantry and an artillery. And then down here, surrounding Varegio, am I pronouncing that right? Ver I think so. There are a total of four units. They've got a unit of seasoned line cavalry, two units of seasoned infantry, and an artillery. Likewise, with these guys, I've got 
a total of two core commanders. Oh, that's a artillery. Hang on, there we go. Sometimes a two millimeter. So here's our two core commanders, and it's gonna be uh, up there is down here is Radi uh, Radivojevich, and then that's uh, Sor Sokariva, I think is that general. I'm not going to try to remember those names. So there's our two core commanders, and the guys in black, now these are actually Prussians. Oh, I, I forgot to close out that. I've actually got a total of five Napoleonic armies that fit in that carrying case. I've got British, French, Austrian, Russian, and Prussian. I'm using the Prussian general. See, so there's this general and his aides, and then a couple of uh, messengers there to scurry off and deliver orders to people. Wherever he stands, these two guys have to remain within eight inches of him, and then all their troops have to stay within four inches. And again, these guys, these reinforcements are going to come in on turn five. So the reinforcements are turn five, turn six, and as I look at this, now that I've got it set up, it occurs to me that the Austrians are actually kind of nicely tucked up here. But we're going to make life a little more complicated for them, because two of these units serving under Redivovoyevich are going to have to start the game deployed south of the river. As you can see, there's only three places to cross. Uh, the only way to cross this bridge is in march order. It's going to slow you down. There's no way to cross the rest of the river. These built-up areas, you have to be in attack column to enter. And then when you leave, you leave in... And these rules are, are, are specified in the built-up area section of the rules... Just double check the rules, and unfortunately these rules don't have a whole lot of redundancy in them. You have to look at a couple of different places to verify these things. Everybody can cross this bridge in march order. The cavalry have to. The cavalry can only enter built-up areas in march order. Infantry, however, can cross in attack order. However, for these built-up areas, the, four, the five villages here in this ring... When you come out of the built-up area, you have to change into march order to move out. So anytime you leave a village, you have to leave in march order. You spend that whole turn in march order. Um, and then we have hills that if you're on the hill shooting down a hill, and my hills are either, you're either in the terrain piece for the hill or you're not, there are defensive bonuses when you are up on top of the hill. Why are we doing a complicated battle like this is a very interesting question because... One of the joys of a game like Absolute Emperor, where you have all of these levels of abstractions that are going to make people twitch. Some guys are going to be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you only have five divisions of infantry? Don't you know that each of those divisions would have ancillary artillery associated with it? Yeah, they're in there. You just can't see them. They're just not represented but that's part of the attack dice that these guys are rolling well you know the french didn't have one big block of cavalry what they would do is they would kind of filter the cavalry out to support each of these individual divisions i know that that's part of the overall attack and but one thing i cannot abide is when i've got one unit of heavy cavalry do i have to no uh i'm gonna go with four units i meant four stands of densely packed. I've got two different stands. I've got two different versions of cavalry, dense and loose. All of these guys need to be loose. As I was saying, I know there wasn't one giant block of cavalry. For the purposes of the game, though, I only have one unit that behaves exclusively as cavalry. All of these infantry units might have attached, whatever, uh, squadrons of, of cavalry, but they're primarily concerned with patrolling that one to two inches of the zone of control. They're in there, they're doing their stuff, but we've abstracted everything down because what we really want to replicate here are the decisions that you as the overall commander make when it comes time to order your, your core commanders, hey, go attack that town, go squat on that town, please. And then it's going to take, I mean, you're talking about 20,000 men here. You're not going to turn 20,000 men on a dime. If you want to give them new orders, that's going to take a ferocious amount of coordination and planning. It's going to take a long time. In the parlance of Absolute Emperor, you got to burn an Elan. And I should probably mention that too as we go. 
the commander, various commanders here have uh, various amounts of Elan. The French are actually at a bit of a disadvantage. It's going to be two for Grenier up there and three Elan down here. And then we have uh, four for Redivovich and three for Samaria. Oh, Somariva, that's his name. Somariva, Redivovich. Three and four. The Austrians have the advantage in Elan. Now, some people would say, whoa, 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 whoa but the, the field marshal is the guy. And I think field marshal, I think he's actually listed in, yeah, Bellegarde, look, he's actually listed in the rule set. He's the first guy. Bellegarde, well, I mean, it's alphabetical as we expect. Bellegarde has an Elan of three. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, where is Bellegarde? Why doesn't he have an Elan? Because that's not the way this game works. To make this game work... I'm going to be giving Elan to that core commander and that core commander. The Austrians have an advantage in Elan because they're highly motivated. The French have an advantage in their numbers. They have a total of seven infantry. Well, they have an advantage in numbers, but not equipment. They've got seven infantry to the five of the Austrians. But the Austrians have three artillery to one for the French. And, of course, it's just kind of a mishmash. The good news is the Austrians are a little more consolidated, but that might be a bad thing. These guys over here might be able to flank accidentally. So I think this is going to be a fascinating exercise. And if the game design is terrible, I mean, let's remember who you're talking to here. When it comes to game design, you know, I'm, I, I'm you know, there are people that are a lot better at it than me. Let's just put it that way. This might not work. It might be a heck of a lot. Well, it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun whether it works or not. But the other thing I'll point out is that one... I don't want to call it a complaint, but one aspect of Absolute Emperor that, that can be a little frustrating for a Napoleonic noob like me is that it is fairly loose... And it does often have a vibe of, well, you know, when it comes to a game situation, just think about what would have happened and then try to apply that logic to your game. Well, that's a problem for me. Because one of the reasons I play games like this is that I don't know what would have happened. I want someone like Bruce, Boyd Bruce, to show me what would have happened if two armies blundered into each other and they couldn't fully support the arms of these these forces, couldn't support each other because there's a big old river in the way? What would happen if two cavalry units fought to a stalemate? Do they withdraw? Do they just stand there fighting? In the last video you saw, I had them just stand there fighting because I don't know. And then when I went back and reviewed it after the, the game was over, I thought, oh, you know what? If, if a cavalry fights a cavalry and there's no clear victor... They both withdraw. Take some thinking, take some reading. It's probably intuitive to those of you guys that have been doing this for a long time. And if you're one of those guys, that's awesome. I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad to have you in the comment section going, you know, historically X, Y, and Z, and U, A, B, and C, because that's kind of how we learn. So even if the game itself isn't teaching me, I really appreciate you guys being here to help me along. I think I'm done flapping my gums for today. The only real last thing that we could, we need to do is get our final deployments down. As I said, these four units have to deploy on opposite sides of the river. They have to deploy within... Um, you know, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put our, our commander as fishing right here on the river. They have to deploy within four inches of him. And then likewise, the overall commander... So we got to... Oh, you know what? Let's break out a ruler here and do some measurements. Our deployments are all completed now. Before we talk about why people are deployed the way they are, we should talk a little bit about victory conditions. If you can chase the other army off the battlefield, reduce both of their corps, Elan, to zero, you win the game. The Austrians have the added incentive that if they control both this village and this village at the end of 12 turns... They win a victory. If the French can hold one of these villages after 12 turns, they win the victory. What does that mean in terms of the game? Well, it means both of these armies are going to be charged with attack. Actually, all four, their orders are going to be attack this village or that village, right? This, this core is attacking here. This core is attacking here. 
As you can see, we put both the cannon, which is currently unlimbered, and one unit of seasoned line infantry on the road because they're closer. They're going to be able to seize it first and have the advantage. Once they've seized it, the orders for this commander switch over to defend, meaning the defend the wherever he is. Okay, this is where things get a little bit complicated. Everybody's got to stay within four inches of him. We've got the other infantry ready to cross the bridge and get up into this area to slow down the French Corps. We've got cavalry that are ready to either hold this bridge, slow them down, or, you know, who knows? You know, come over and support that one infantry at driving these guys off. It's 12 turns. You've got reinforcements coming in on turn six and turn five here for the Austrians on that hill and six on the road for the French. That's going to be kind of important. Oh, you know, the other thing I'm going to do before we go any further is put each of these French units, including the reinforcements, just so I don't forget, they are going to be in column attack. Because if we look at the period and nation-specific rules, again, I'm not going to go through all this in the next video. We're just going to dive right into turn one. The French in 1814 are a bit hampered because... Uh, only one corps commander can be rated above three Alon. Like I said, it's going to be two and three. And then uh, the infantry cannot use line formation. The cavalry receive no charge bonus. Artillery must reroll one successful hit beyond canister range. So when this gun is shooting, it only hits on a five up, and it's got to roll five up twice. Only one out of every nine shots is actually going to hit anything. But remember, they do have, assuming they've got line of sight, they do have a 12-inch range. That might help. If they're shooting at guys that are in a, a built-up area, then you've got the added problem of they have to roll a six twice in a row in order to hit anything. So bear that in mind. Uh, for the Austrians, they have gotten better over the years, and their special rules are the seasoned infantry, which is all of them, use massed column tactics. They automatically form square against cavalry, but are hit by four up on artillery. Oh! Okay, if this guy is firing at infantry, he hits on a 4-up, but he's got to hit roll a 4 twice. These guys automatically form square against that one lone cavalry. All right, good to know. We do have a fairly limited amount of cavalry. I'm kind of curious. I wonder if maybe we shouldn't order both of these guys to take that village drive off the main body, and then burn an Elan to send whoever is the freshest down to try to take this. I don't think you do. I think you're closer. I think you seize him and just hold on to him as much as possible. That's going to kind of be a bit of a problem because this cavalry unit is stuck down here. It's not going to be able to ride up and chase them off. This cavalry unit does get... The, the Austrians can use line, and they do get a charge bonus for the Austrian cavalry, so... The more I look at this, I'm kind of wishing I had one more unit of conscripts for the French to balance things out. But I say that, oh, this is wildly unbalanced. I should do something to balance it. And then, you know, the results are way different than I expected. So let's go ahead and call it quits right there. And we'll pick up the game in the next video with the first round. As I said, 12 turns. If the Austrians can hold both of these, they automatically win. If the French hold one of them, they automatically win. And if either side has both cores reduced to zero Alon, the other team wins. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow. I'm praying for you.